Hi, I'm Bob Clark, and uh, I'm editor of Overland Journal for the Oregon California Trails Association. I'm here with Susan Dregu, who is the recently elected president of the Oklahoma chapter of the Butterfield National Historic Trail Association. Uh, it's great to have you here, Susan. I want to thank you for the article you contributed to Overland Journal, which is Butterfield's Overland Mail in the Indian Territory. We published it in our summer issue, just released a few weeks ago. And uh, we're going to have a chat about it now in our Riding the West series. Welcome. Thanks, Bob. It's great to be here. Thanks. Uh, first of all, tell us about the article and uh, the Butterfield Overland Mail and its trail. Yeah. Yes, the Butterfield Overland Mail was a short-lived but very significant stagecoach line that ran from 1858 to 1861 across the southern part of the United States. And it was the first transcontinental overland mail route. And it was significant because the uh, huge population shift that had occurred from the East Coast to the West Coast uh, in the 1850s created a huge demand for better communication between the two coasts. And of course, at the time also, there was a, a lot of demand for the Transcontinental Railroad to be built. And there was a great desire for connecting the two coasts. And the Butterfield Overland Mail served to deliver mail from actually two termini, St. Louis, Missouri and Memphis, Tennessee, all the way to San Francisco in 25 days, which was quite a short time yes. compared with the uh, steamship delivery that they had been dependent on for many years. Yeah. And it operated until the beginning of the Civil War in the spring of 1861. The route went down through Ar Missouri and Arkansas and Indian Territory, Texas, then across the, the southern border, New Mexico and Arizona, and then up to San Francisco in California. So it was about 2,800 2, miles, and about 200 of those miles went through the Indian Territory, the Choctaw and Chickasaw nations specifically at the mm -hmm. time. And so the article focuses on the segment of the trail in Indian Territory, the geography, the history of that road, uh, the culture of the Choctaws in particular at that time, because they were the, the majority of the trail went through the Choctaw Nation and what we can still see of the trail today. Pretty neat. Tell me about uh, recent legislation in Congress about the Butterfield Trail. Yes, the Butterfield Trail was just uh, approved in January of this year as a national historic trail. So it joins a large number of other trails that are part of that national system administered by the National Park Service. Yeah. So we are eager to work with the National Park Service to implement their plans to preserve and protect the trail, to provide more public education and create tourism opportunities along the way. That's wonderful. I know a lot of people work very hard to get that done. So I'm glad it's finally happened. What drew you to studying the Butterfield Overland Trail? My husband and I have been travel writers for quite some time and about, uh, well, and focused on adventure travel in particular. And about 10 years ago, we have, we have an interest in history and read the book Empire of the Summer Moon by S.C. Gwynn about the Comanche Nation, in particular, Quanta Parker. Yeah. In the last days of the Comanche Nation, uh, of their early days, in any case, we realized that that is right in our own backyard. Yeah. The Texas Panhandle in Western Oklahoma, and decided to do some historical travel and exploration and write about it. Mm -hmm. And that was successful, and we had a great time. And I began looking for others, other historic trails to explore. 
and uh, I I found uh, an English botanist named Thomas Nuttall who had explored into central Oklahoma in 1819 and retraced his trail. And uh, of course, Randolph Marcy's 1849 trail across Oklahoma and all these things in our home state. So really enjoyed that, uh, that right in our own backyard kind of exploration and opportunities to write about it. And in the course of my research for Marcy's Wagon Road, I came across the Butterfield mm -hmm. and specifically the work that had been done in the past about identifying the trail across Indian Territory, now southeastern Oklahoma, and marking it. And just there's a lot of uh, scholarship in the Chronicles of Oklahoma, which is the journal of the Oklahoma Historical Society, about that segment. So fascinated me. And in 2016, my husband, Bill, and I started exploring the trail. And the more I explored it, the more I felt compelled to go deeper into it. And uh, so that has been uh, a mission for me since then. And I've made many trips out into the, the woods along the trail in the last uh, seven, almost eight years now. So in going out and exploring the trail, were you having to get off the beaten track quite a bit, or is the trail along major highways today? The trail is off the beaten track, and ah. that's what makes it really fun. The trail was abandoned after the coming of the railroad in 1872. Mm -hmm. And that was a mixed blessing, of course, for the communities along the trail. It wasn't a, a good thing necessarily, but it's not paved under a, a federal highway now. And so there are a lot of wagon ruts and swales and springs and foundation stones still to be found along the trail. And the road in is is not intact, of course, there, but there are county roads that have been built along either on the trail or alongside the trail. So you can travel the approximate route of the Butterfield all the way across Oklahoma. And it is primarily back roads, which is really a joy because you can get that feeling of traveling back in time. Yes. Um, so we have remnants found in the ruts. Uh, and the pathways. Are there other remnants of that time and, and period along the route? There are a few. Uh, in particular, there is one structure that is along the route. It is the Edward Store, and it was built in 1850, and the log structure still exists in mm -hmm. good condition, mm -hmm. which is very remarkable for a log structure. And it was believed to be a meal stop for passengers along the Butterfield. The uh, Edward store uh, is now being preserved. And so there's some, some major work going on in the hopes of creating it as a, a tourism opportunity, a community center. And so that's that's pretty exciting. It's really, that is. Absolutely. really neat to have that. Yeah, it's okay. a great resource. What were the roads like in those days? What were they traveling over? How rough was it? Well, it was quite rough. There were very few actual roads. Most of them were those that had been built by the military. And uh, military roads in Indian Territory were first established in the 1820s. Ah. From Fort Smith to Fort Gibson and Fort Smith to Fort Towson. Fort Smith was kind of the center of the world at that point in the Southwest. And so they were, they were very rough and rocky. There were no, once the, uh, the five tribes were removed from the Southeastern United States to the Indian territory, there was some improvement on the roads in particular, the road that was used or the Butterfield was a Chickasaw removal route from Fort Smith to Boggy mm. Depot. Mm -hmm. So the Chickasaw Nation and the Choctaw Nation, however, did not fund road improvements. However, they did require six days a year of labor 
from their male citizens on the roads. So there was some work on the roads. And but they were still very, very rugged. And the stagecoach travelers uh, often talked about the bouncing and jolting and the discomfort on the hard wooden seats because they weren't riding in flush stagecoaches that we think of as a, a, like the Concord coaches. Uh, they were riding in what was called a celerity wagon that had mm. wooden seats and not nearly the nice suspension uh, that uh, the stagecoaches that were used in the more settled areas. Yes. Uh, you know, many of the journals and letters that I've read over the years on overland travel, the first encounter that immigrants have with Native Americans is always a big deal and usually quite a bit's written in either their letter or their journal. People on the Butterfield, I imagine, are kind of having a similar experience as they get to Indian territory. Probably some of them have not never had contact with uh, the tribes. So did they have much contact or were they just buzzing through at five miles an hour? Well, actually, they did have quite a bit of contact. They would stop to change horses at the stations and sometimes they would be able to get out so rarely did they have time to do much of anything because they traveled night and day uh -huh. but for instance uh waterman ormsby who was the first three passenger on the first butterfield stagecoach going east to west um he he spoke about numerous station keepers that he met along the way and all the station keepers uh, for the 12 stage stations in Indian Territory were either Choctaw or Chickasaw citizens. So he interacted with them, and that was typical of, of yeah. travelers, that they would interact with the station keepers or someone working there for the station keepers, who were usually Choctaw or Chickasaw. And the interesting thing that maybe most people don't know is that these tended to be mixed blood Choctaws or Chickasaws, and Waterman Ormsby mentioned that uh, the uh, Governor Walker, Tandy Walker, who was the station keeper for Walker's station, the most, the easternmost of the Indian Territory stations, that he looked like a white man. Yeah. Well, he was actually probably more white than he was Indian. Uh, there had been intermarriage for many years uh, among the southeastern tribes and the the wealthier class, uh, the uh, political leadership of the Choctaws and Chickasaws tended to be the mixed blood. So there were more interaction among between them. So the, the anticipation of someone coming from New York City, like Waterman Ormsby, uh, to have contact with what they called then the, the wild, wild Indians, which yeah. were the Plains tribes, um, was was really did not really come to fruition within the Indian Territory, although farther west there was some uh, some realistic concern. But their cultural contact was very different than it would have been on the Oregon California Trail or one of the other trails. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you have any plans to continue your study of the trail, and where are you going to go with this? Well, I'm writing a book. Uh -huh. on the uh, Butterfield Trail in Indian Territory. And I am continuing to study the trail. Uh, thank you so much for this time. We've got to cut it off for now. Uh, I want to thank you, Susan, for joining me and any of you that are, are watching on YouTube. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if, you, if you'd like to get more information, certainly Overland Journal has that. And if you're not a member of OCTA, join us. Uh, you can go to our website and access us there, and we'd love to have you as part of the membership. You'll get the Overland Journal every quarter uh, automatically. Uh, I invite you to uh, find your own trail and enjoy that time out on the road. Thanks, Susan, very much. Thank you, Bob.